All right, Job 1 and 2. I want to specifically, uh, first of all, look at verse uh, chapter 2, verse 3. Chapter 2, verse 3. Honestly, this just jumped out at me just now as he was reading, and I wanted to share that to start the message out. Chapter uh, 2, verse 3, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one, uh, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? That's kind of what he said in chapter 1. That's the first thing he said as well, right? Hey, have you considered my servant Job? But look at this uh, next part. And still he holdeth fast his integrity, Although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. <laughs> I don't know. You're just, I, I'm sure that didn't mean anything to you. But I'm just studying for this message and I'm thinking, okay, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. That's the title of the message, the accuser of the brother. And I'm thinking, you know, what did I, I've often said this, when something bad happens in my life and I'm kind of, I feel like I'm being punished for it or whatever. I don't typically say, God, why are you letting me go through this? You know, I think of men far better than I am, you know, far more like God, godly than I am who are going through worse things than I'm going through. And I think, well, I deserve everything I get, <laughs> right? And I look at the life of Job sometimes. And I think, man, can you imagine being that man who God's saying, hey, have you considered my servant Rocky? You know, <laughs> he's a man that loves the Lord and eschews evil and all that. that would, what, how, how tremendous that would be. But you know what I don't want? I don't want Satan to say, oh, yeah. <laughs> He's only worshiping you because everything's going great in his life. No, stay away, devil. <laughs> I don't want to have to prove it, okay? I, I want to live for the Lord and do good things. I don't want to have to prove it by bad things going in my life. But isn't that, apparently, we're reading this. This is what the devil does, right? <laughs> he actually throws that, and he can actually move God to allow things to happen to us. To, to prove. Aren't you going to be glad whenever Satan's not around to do that anymore. <laughs> so let's go to Revelation, because you already probably know where that phrase comes from, the accuser of the brethren. And there is coming a time when Satan won't be around to do that anymore. Amen. Revelation chapter 12, starting in verse 7. Revelation 12, 7. I'm not going to give a whole lot of background. There's some debate as to what exactly is going on here in chapter 12. Uh, I probably won't say a whole lot about that, but let's just read starting in verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto the end. Now, how many of you think that happened before, say, uh, before Job, and uh, that's that time that we <laughs> that we read that? There's some differences of opinions there, right? I look at this and read that, and saying that this is something that is yet to come. This is a time there, uh, as we go right before the great tribulation, and he says, "Hey, my time is short, and so I'm going to go out and do all this that I can." Uh, to continue to deceive the world, because he continues to deceive the world now, doesn't he? Amen. And to continue to, I think, uh, accuse the brethren. Okay. Now, real quickly, let's go to Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24 and 25 is a long uh, court case between Paul and uh, some of the Jews there are bringing forth, forth accusation upon him or about him acts chapter 24 and uh let me see here i'm gonna read the first 13 verses but like i said all chapter 24 and 25 talks about this same case and after five days and nights the high priest descended with the elders and with a certain orator named tertullus and informed the governor against paul and when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, 
seeing that by these we enjoy great quietness, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy province. It's kind of like a, a lawyer, isn't it, to butter up the judge <laughs> before he get, presents his case. We accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thanksgiving. Notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray thee that thou wouldest hear us of thy clemency a few words. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow, Amen. Independent Baptists, they're all pestilent fellows. And a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, and the ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, who also hath gone about to profane the temple who we took and would have judged according to our law. But the chief captain, Lysias, came upon us and with great violence took him away out of our hands commanding his accusers to come unto thee by examining of whom thyself take, uh, uh, mayest take knowledge of all these things whereof we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. Then Paul, after that the governor held, uh, had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. Because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, uh, neither in the synagogues nor in the city. Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophet, prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, uh, both of the just and the unjust. And actually, he's using a lot of wisdom there, and he's turning those people against each other because there's some Sadducees that don't believe in the resurrection and the Pharisees that believe. And so he's doing everything he can to win his case right here. But basically what we see here, and, and, and if you keep reading in chapter 24, the word accuse and accuser and accuse, all, all these uh, uh, words are used quite frequently. And what we see here is that this is a legal term. They're before the court. You notice whenever he said, you know, he listened to the prosecutor and then, he, and then he beckoned to Paul that Paul would talk. And so you see this judge sitting here. Uh, and then you not only have the judge, but you have this prosecutor. And you see him using the flowery speech, your honorable, your honorable judge, <laughs> you know, if I could approach the, I mean, you know, there's just all this thing. Like you see a court case right here. And, this, and what you see is this prosecutor says that these people, I'm, I'm representing these people, these nice Jews over here, and they have ought against this man, and we're accusing him of X, Y, Z. And then when Paul gets his opportunity to speak, he says, they can't prove any of this stuff that they're accusing me of. So you see this court case going on, right? One guy is accusing another guy. They take it before the judge. Aren't you glad that when we stand before God on Judgment Day, we're not going to have to defend have, we're not going to have to defend ourselves <laughs> for the things that we're accused of. Yeah. Bible says in First uh, John two one that Jesus is our advocate. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with our Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. It says that he's our mediator. It says First uh, Timothy. 2, 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And so there's going to come a time, and I believe to some extent that's, I mean, already just like Job was, you know, I've often thought about that. We all know nobody's perfect and nobody's without sin. We all know that Job wasn't a sinless man, but here's God presenting him like, ah, my servant Job, a perfect man. And it's askew with evil. I mean, <laughs> you know, the record's clear, right? And that's the way I want to be in my relationship with, with, uh, with the Lord. And if I do find sin in my life, what should we do according to the Bible? Go to Jesus, our advocate, right? And, uh, and, and he, will, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. But, but our standing before God and our relationship with him when it comes to going into heaven and what have you, you know, Jesus has already paid for all that. Amen. Jesus has already, you know, we're not going to have to give an account for that. Praise yeah. the Lord. And so here what we see, uh, I want to present this concept of Satan 
being the accuser of the brethren. Okay, and you read this uh, this story in jo Job 1 and 2 where he comes before God and he's accusing his uh, uh, God's servant Job. And I want to make a few points about Satan as the accuser of the brethren. But then here's the main point of what I want to do. This is as I began to study this. Actually, uh, Brother Joshua Dare, shout out to him. I think he's supposed to be watching. And, uh, and also my wife. Hello, sweetie. Uh, she's supposed to be watching because she's, she's not feeling well. No, it's not the COVID-19, so in case you're wondering. But she's not feeling good. And so uh, uh, anyway, Brother Joshua Dare and I were talking a while back. And he said he was studying about this, thinking about Satan as the accuser of the brethren. And he said, hey, uh, you know, if I could make a recommendation, could you preach on that someday? I'd really like to hear that. So here you go, Brother Josh. <laughs> but it's a little different uh, than what I originally meant for it to be. But here's what I want you to focus on. I'm going to talk about Satan, three things about Satan being the accuser of the brethren. But then I want to point out how we ought not, as Christians, to be satanic. We ought not to be satanic in being an accuser of the brethren in a, in a similar way uh, to which we see Satan doing that. Okay, so number one is this. Number one, Satan is selfishly motivated in his accusation, accusations of the brethren, right? He's selfishly motivated. I mean, think about that. If he gets somebody into trouble, what's that do for him? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, what is he really, what is anybody going to benefit by him getting someone into trouble. Is it going to gain him any rewards? <laughs> no. You know, at the end of the day, you know, if he destroys as many people as he can possibly destroy, does that make any difference as to how he's going to spend all of eternity? No, he's still destined for an eternity in hell. Whether he, you know, no matter what he does right now, I mean, what is his motivation in accusing the brother? Oh, yeah, did you see what he did, God? Well, what does it matter to you? <laughs> right? What does it matter to the devil what other people are doing? Right? But he's selfishly motivating. There's something, there's some reason he wants to accuse the brethren. There's some reason he wants to destroy everybody, right? He walketh about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Why? What's his motivation? Well, I would submit this. His motivation is the same because it comes from the same place. The same thing as what a reprobate's motivation is for doing the things that they do. Right? Romans 1, 32. You can turn there if you want. I'm just going to start reading it. Who This is talking about these people who live this uh, uh, lifestyle of just being a reprobate and doing just all manners of wickedness. Okay? And it says in Romans 1.32, Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. I mean, the Bible said that Satan knows his time is short. He knows what his end is like. Right? It's not like he thinks he's going to be able to change anyone's mind. He knows that his works are worthy of death. And this is what it says about the reprobates. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Man, if he could get somebody into trouble, <laughs> that's, you know, it's enjoyable, right? You go down, you want somebody to go down with you. You know, he gets some kind of pleasure out of getting people to do wickedly and to have a, a, a bad thoughts and to, and to do bad things and, and all that. There's some kind of, uh, of, of a evil motivation that he has behind that it does him no good. It's not going to help him with anything, uh, but he likes to get other people in trouble. And as Christians, here's the thing. You guys know this. We do have a responsibility to, to judge, don't we? I mean, you know, I know people like the don't judge, don't judge, thou shalt not judge, right? And I'm going to get to that part in a minute. But uh, everybody always says these kinds of things, and they usually they don't even know where to find it in the Bible, how to exactly quote it or what follows that or anything like that. They just know, hey, you're not supposed to judge me. And so they'll talk about that. But we do have, the Bible says, a responsibility as Christians. We have to judge. I mean, one thing we have to judge as Christians is in our church, we might have to decide, make some decisions as to, you know, the, the behavior of certain people in there. It's our, our responsibility. Fathers have to make some decisions about their children because they have a responsibility. You know, husbands have to make some uh, decisions about, their, uh, about their, their wives because they have responsibilities towards that. Bosses have to judge their their employees or their servants, as the Bible would say, masters have to judge their servants. There's a lot of judgments that need to be made, and the Bible doesn't say, in fact, the Bible says one day you're going to judge angels, <laughs> right? Amen. And so he's saying, couldn't you uh, deal with these things among yourselves in the church? I mean, why would you go to the, to the law uh, with your brethren, right? In the, in the world's court system, why would you do that? Can't you take care of these things? And that's going to require judgment, right? 
So we do have a responsibility to judge. We know that. But here's what we need to do. We need to make sure that when we are making judgments, we are not acting like Satan and like reprobates. What's our motivation for judging? You know, what's our motivation for bringing accusations against people and all that? What are, what are we hoping to gain out of it? Are we just hoping somebody else can fall so that, you know, we don't look as bad? Are we hoping that we can, you know, bring somebody else down? I mean, there's, there, who knows what the motivation is for people when they make certain judgments and they accuse people before God. Look at Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. This is a great passage of Scripture here. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now, how often when we're accusing somebody or tearing somebody down because something they did, how often do we actually stop and think, man, I sure hope that never happens to me. <laughs> it's almost like with this attitude like, oh, I would never do that. That would never happen to me, and we're just accusing somebody. He says, it, when you do that, you're, you're trying to re, your motivation should be one of meekness, trying to restore that brethren, right? And uh, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And here's what it says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if any man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him uh, that teacheth in all good things. I went farther than I was going to. But you see that point there as far as our motivation. Our motivation should be to lift people up. Right? There's a time to judge. But what's the motivation behind it? And Satan's motivation is one that is self serving and we don't want to do that we want to make sure it doesn't mean don't judge doesn't mean don't take uh, certain steps to bring a certain behavior before somebody or better yet do as christ said you know hey if you got a problem with your brother go to him privately right. if you can't get that worked out bring somebody else with you and then at some point it goes before the church i mean there's something, uh, the steps that need to be taken to correct some things sometimes, but we want to be careful when we're accusing somebody or we are uh, uh, bringing forth an accusation about them that we do it with the right motivation. Okay, number two. Number two, Satan is hypocritical in accusing the brethren. He's hypocritical in accusing the brethren. I mean, <clears throat> certainly... Satan doesn't have anything to brag about. <laughs> What's he going to brag about? Do you see how these people aren't serving you, God? What are you doing? <laughs> I mean, you know, I remember a time when you were one of the chiefest uh, uh, cherub of the cherubs, right? And now you lifted up yourself with pride, Lucifer, and you are fallen from, from grace because of that. And, and man, you've been seeking from the very beginning in the garden, trying to get people to fall and, and uh, trying to get people to do evil and, and turn on God. I mean, what are you bragging about <laughs> as you're sitting there accusing everybody else of certain things, okay? Satan uh, certainly has nothing from which, uh, for which to brag. And so, uh, but isn't it true that so often we accuse and we, adju we judge other people? And again, I'm not against that. I think there's a time for it. But man, let's be honest. When we do that so many times, what we do is we fail to recognize that in our own lives, we've got a lot of things uh, wrong, too. I mean, I hate to use the cliche, but somebody once said, if you're pointing you know, a finger at somebody else, you got three fingers pointing back at you or whatever. Man, I sometimes will start accusing somebody. This is why, okay, you've probably heard this before, but like whatever your strength is, spiritually speaking, your spiritual gift, if you will, can also be like your, uh, your downfall. All right. For instance, somebody is the prophet type. I mean, they're just they see something that's black and white. Hey, this is what you know, that person can maybe get fall down uh, uh, to a path of where they're not showing mercy. 
which is a good godly thing to do to show mercy to somebody. But man, they've got this just ability to say, no, but the Bible says this, and, the Bible, and, and they don't show mercy. And the opposite is a person who has a gift of mercy. Man, I, I don't have a problem overlooking, and this is me, by, by the way. I think that I'm pretty easy at showing mercy to people and saying, hey, you know, I understand, you know, we all make mistakes and all that kind of stuff. The reason for that is because I know my, my faults. I know my failures, but look, that can also be a fault because then all you want to do is show mercy and you never like take a stand and say, no, but the, you know, we have to lay down the law or whatever, uh, whatever your strength is can also be your weakness. Does that make sense? Right. But look, shouldn't we all be merciful from time to time? Yeah, right. Recognizing that, Hey, I'm not perfect. <laughs> I certainly make a lot of mistakes and have a lot of faults as well. So we got to be careful when we are going down that road of making an accusation or judging somebody that we realize not only that uh, the motivation is not a, a selfish motivation, but also that it's not hypocritical, you know. And this is what we, we know, this, this is what Matthew 7 was actually talking about, judge not, right, that you be not judged. And it says, for with the same judgment that you judge, you shall be judged, right? Sorry if I'm misquoting this. And then he goes on and talks about the, you know, you're, you're, you're beholding the, the moat in your brother's eye, but you got a beam in your own eye. What he's saying is remove that beam, and then you can see clearly to help get the, the moat out of your brother's eye, right? So this is the idea. Look at Romans chapter 2. Now, we already read uh, the end of Romans chapter 1, and we like that chapter. I mean, any chance you get, uh, any opportunity you have to preach Romans 1, do it. Amen. That's a good, ver that's a good chapter. But then chapter 2 starts off like this. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For where, now it doesn't say, you can't take the twist that and make it mean, hey, you should never judge anybody. Because then that would be contradicting a lot of other scriptures, right? But here's what he means. <clears throat> For the, wherefore thou judgest of an, another... Thou condemnest thyself, right? With the same judgment ye judge others, you shall be, you shall be judged. For that thou judgest, uh, that thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? <laughs> You judge somebody, you better be thinking in your heart, man, am I guilty of doing the same thing? Right. You know, because if you are, you got no business judging or accusing somebody Amen. of such a thing. And the third thing is this. Not only is Satan selfish, selfishly motivated in his, in his accusations, and he's hypocritical in his accusations of the brethren. Number three is this. Satan is out of his jurisdiction in accusing the brethren. You ever think about that? Look at uh, Proverbs chapter 30, if you would. Now, obviously, God allowed him to do that, and God uses evil for good. And so the bad things that Satan does, God allows that opportunity of testing and proving somebody to be a good thing for them. I mean, there's, uh, there's a lot of ways in which God will uh, use these types of things. Look at Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30, look at verse 10. Accuse not a servant unto his master, lest he curse thee, and thou be found guilty. Right? The Bible talks about how you're not supposed to, uh, not just in that place, but other places as well. Don't judge another man's servant. Right? That's his job. <laughs> you, know, you know, you don't have to, that's not your job uh, to go around doing that. And so here's the thing. Look at, look at Titus. Titus 1. I noticed this while I was studying uh, the word accusation and, and accusing. <clears throat> Titus chapter 1, verse 6. This is, as you know, the qualifications of a pastor or a bishop. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children... I've preached this text so many times, and I, don't, I guess I, this never really jumped out at me. Having faithful children not accused of riot or unruly <laughs> doesn't even necessarily mean that they're guilty of it. It just means they got this reputation, 
I don't know how they got that reputation. By the way, preachers' kids often have a reputation of being unruly kids. Have you ever seen that? I, I don't know why. Maybe just because all eyes are on them. And so when they mess up, people are like, oh, look, the preacher's kid. Look what he's doing, right? And so, uh, uh, so that could definitely happen. But, you know, uh, one of the things that people don't think about when they began, like, accusing a, a preacher's kid or something like that is that actually they could be messing up the reputation of the pastor, you know, and kind of to some degree maybe messing up even the fact whether he's qualified or not. If everybody thinks, man, his kids, man, have you ever seen his kids? And, you know, I don't even, well, whatever accusations they might throw out about that, man, they could be damaging a person's reputation. And every person that we judge or make an accusation about, we need to take it very seriously because we could be damaging their reputation. We could be turning other people against them, right? There's, uh, there's so many things that we could be doing. And so the Bible does talk about being super careful when it comes to making accusations or, or, or accusing somebody. And here's the point that I'm trying to make with this. If you're going to judge or accuse somebody, stay in your jurisdiction. You know, what business does Satan have judging another man's servants? Look, God, did you see your servant over here? Hey, stay out of my business, Satan, <laughs> right? I mean, God can do what he wants. And like I said, God knows all things and he uses Satan to be able to accomplish good by testing uh, saints and building their patience and all this kind of stuff. But like when I really think about that, I'm like, what in the world business is it of Satan's what God's people do, right? What is he doing accusing and judging? I like how Isaiah 36, 16, the second part of that verse says this, Eat ye every one of his vine... And every one of his fig tree, and drink ye every one the waters of his own cistern. Right? I like that. Several times in the Bible it talks about drink waters out of your own cistern. You know, mind to those things that are yours. And, uh, and don't worry about, uh, about making judgment on other people. So here's the thing. As a, as a pastor, I should stick to making judgments that deal with our church. Right? I don't need to be accusing people from other churches. I don't need to be accusing other pastors from other churches, right? That's not really my jurisdiction. Is there ever time to do that? I suppose. I suppose there would be a time where I would say, hey, man, I really got to go to this person. You know, I really got to try to stop this thing from happening. It's affecting, you know, my life or, or the, uh, the jurisdiction God has given me some authority over. And I would maybe have to do that. But for the most part, I should just stick to my own business and mind what's going on in these walls, right? And in Iola. And, uh, and think about that. Husbands, Bible talks about ruling your, your own wives and your own children. Look, we shouldn't be worried about the way another man runs his house and making all these kind of accusations and looking at his children and looking at his wife and how his wife dresses and how his wife cuts her hair and all that kind of stuff. Look, man, just... Mind your own business. <laughs> Mind your, stay in your own jurisdiction, right? Bosses, they should be ruling over their own employees. Uh, these are the things, matters of authority that God gives us. It's not our position or uh, of, a, if, a, if, if, or here's, I'm sorry. If you are not in a position of authority, you say, well, I don't have kids. I don't have a wife. I don't have a church that I'm pastoring. I don't have, I'm not a boss over different people. Well, then probably just mind, you know, your authorities and obey them and live a life pleasing to God, uh, doing what God would have you to do. And now, now let me tell you that. You say, oh, well, you just think you're something because you're a pastor and you're a husband and you're... And, uh, no, actually, guess what? If I step out of this building and I go work for somebody, I don't say to them, who do you think you are telling me what to do? Don't you know I'm the pastor of Iola Baptist Temple? <laughs> No, I go, hey, you're the boss. Whatever you say goes, right? I'm under your authority right now. <laughs> now, if he says, hey, this is how your wife's going to dress, get lost, Jack, <laughs> right? That's not your jurisdiction. But when I'm in your house, you know, I go by your rules. When I'm, doing, when I'm in whatever jurisdiction I am, uh, that is, look, I don't, being a pastor doesn't mean, if I go into someone else's house, and the lady does something I don't like. I'm not like, hey, woman, <laughs> did you hear what I said? Get up and get me a drink. I know guys like that. It's like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I mean, I can't think of any offhand, but I'm just saying. <laughs> Can you imagine somebody being like that? 
you know, well, you're a woman. You, you're supposed to serve me. No, no, no. That's not what the Bible says, right? She is supposed to honor her husband and to obey her husband, right? That doesn't make her everybody's, you know, wife. <laughs> and so you don't, uh, you need to stay in your jurisdiction. I think this is a short message, man, but I just flew through this. So here's the conclusion. We are going to continue to get accused by Satan, right? I wish we weren't. I wish, I wish like, you know, tomorrow he was just, he was no longer able to accuse us and, and, and cause all these problems. But he's going to continue to accuse us. Right. Satan, I, I believe until that day, if, uh, this is my understanding of, of Revelation 12, okay? I wasn't sure if I was going to give it an explanation of that or not. My understanding of Revelation 12 is this. Right before Satan empowers uh, the Antichrist, however he does that, I don't know. Right before he does that, you know, he, he, he's kicked out of heaven. And he's no longer allowed to go up between uh, heaven and earth and accuse the brethren before God. And so all the people in heaven are saying, praise the Lord, our salvation is, is near, is nigh. I mean, you know, the accuser of our brethren is cast out. And so that's my understanding of that. And so what happens if you read the Bible is at that point, the Antichrist is emboldened and there's tribulation like never before. This is the great tribulation, okay, that leads up to the point where God says, all right, now's the time the rapture takes place. And then God's going to pour out his wrath on, on everybody, okay? So this is what I think. I think that until that day, whenever that is, Satan's going to continue to accuse the brethren. He's going to continue to bring these things before God. We're going to continue. He's going to continue to turn people against each other and get us to turn on each other and get us to accuse the brethren and get us to cause all these kinds of problems. He's going to continue to do that. And guess what? We're going to continue to get accused by others. Jesus was accused by others. If you're studying the word accuse, what you're going to find over and over is through the Gospels. The Jews were looking for a reason to accuse him, right? And they were accusing him of doing these different things. And just like, uh, just like Paul said, hey, you can't prove any of these things you're accusing me of. And Jesus was able to turn that on them. Now, look, we've got to walk circumspectly as Christians. And we've got to be prepared for those people who are going to... Uh, 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 throw accusations out here. First Peter three sixteen says this: having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you, uh, falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. So we ought to do everything we can to avoid people having a reason to accuse us, right? But the point of this message is we also need to make sure then that we're careful not to judge and accuse others with a false motivation, accuse and judge others hypocritically, accuse and judge others in areas that are out of our jurisdiction, right? And we need to just work, pay attention to our own things, work with our own hands, mind our own business, not to be tail bearers and busybodies and all that kind of stuff, but just to deal with God's given us. And if I do that, and you do that, and your boss does that, and husbands do that at their individual houses, man, we could get so much accomplished for the Lord, and there wouldn't be all this turning and fighting, and hey, well, he did that, and hey, now we're, you know, this church hates that church, and nobody's working together, and different factions inside each churches because these guys are accusing each other of different things. Hey, it happened all throughout the Bible. It happened all throughout history. Why won't it happen now? I believe it'll happen up until the day that Satan is kicked out of heaven, you know, being allowed to go, go before God and accuse the brethren. And, uh, and before the rapture, which praise the Lord, he'll never be able to do that to us again. If we do those kinds of things, we're being satanic. Let's pray. Father, I pray your blessings on this church. And uh, Lord, help me as a leader to be the leader I need to be and to, uh, uh, to mind the things that you've given me to mine. He'll give me wisdom, Lord, and uh, boldness and strength to make wise decisions. And I pray that you help everyone in here in the areas of their life that they have um, to uh, have authority over others, that they would be able to uh, control those 
situations in a way that would be pleasing to you as well. And Father, ultimately, we just pray you be glorified with our lives, that we get a lot accomplished. We'd see a lot of souls saved, Lord. We'd raise up uh, others uh, to uh, learn how to do the same things and to know your, the words from your, your Bible. And, and Lord, help us just to stay focused on what the main goal is and to do the first work you've called us to do and uh, to be pleasing to you in the end. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.